it's great to be here uh, among like-minded colleagues from academia mostly and some from industry that live and breathe wireless communications and systems. Uh, when I present, nine out of 10 times, I present to a communication service provider, also known as Telco. And I often start with this slide. I, just to, to become more annoying, I also put labels. I may change the title of the slide, and I put labels like AT&T and Google, Verizon and Netflix, and they all get it. I don't need to explain here who represents the well-worn technology of yesteryear and who represents the likes of Apple and Google and Netflix and Amazon and Microsoft and on and on and on, right? Um, telcos harbor two less than noble sentiments about the new kids in the block, the Googles and the Apples, etc. Envy and dismay. Envy because they would love to have their growth, their revenue growth, their agility, their efficiency of operations, and dismay because they get a free ride on their networks, while operators continue to spend billions of dollars to expand their networks to cope with the traffic that, as you know, grows faster than Moore's law. But uh, we all know, well, most of us know, or I hope it's true, that wisdom also comes with maturity, right? So maybe telcos have not had the last word yet. Um, as a matter of fact, they own the spectrum, which is the most valuable resource, right? So today, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, a couple of technologies that may prove to be the key to growth for network operators. And um, in fact, uh, they may be also the key to them becoming pretty much like, you know, competitors with uh, refreshing themselves, becoming, you know, the uh, agile, efficient network operators, just like, you know, the likes of the hyperscalers today. They have the potential. The question is whether they have uh, the will. So 5G, 5G promises to change our world. You know, the fourth industrial revolution, everything connected. We've heard several talks about how we improve wireless communications, how everything is going to be connected, 30, 40, 50 billion devices connected. Uh, connectivity is going to be ubiquitous. Uh, it will follow us. And the question is, are we going to have the level of security, the level of performance that is necessary for us to really ride this, um, this amazing um, evolution in technology? And in, in, you know, uh, there's no question that 5G is going to, to impact pretty much every sector uh, of, of the industry. Uh, the government, the enterprise, you know, the educational system, the healthcare. Uh, we see here some of the many, many applications of 5G. Uh, several markets, they represent trillions of dollars of new revenue opportunities. Um, that's according to Ericsson, but also many analysts have supported that you know, projection, yet it's not here quite yet. It's still taking time, but that should not come as a surprise, right? We're talking about mobile network operators. They don't move very quickly. Um, but we see signs, we see adoption in certain parts of the world with pretty impressive results. Uh, 5G also is going to be more sustainable we have ways to address energy efficiency. We have ways to lower power consumption. You've heard several presentations today, and I was quite impressed by some of them that, uh, you know, are very promising. And I love the idea of doing away with batteries, right? Who doesn't love that, you know, technology? Very promising. So 5G addresses a lot of those, you know, sustainability issues. And um, 
a new set of network uh, of radio technologies come to uh, enhance the potential of not only saving energy, but becoming a far more, uh, building a far more agile and efficient network. So on the radio side, we have new technologies. We have massive MIMO, up to 128 receive, transmit, right? By 128, we have beamforming the ability to really tailor the power and the signal to where you need to uh, focus uh, the signal uh, carrier aggregation and other significant technology. Uh, we have um, uh, new modulation techniques. And of course, 5G addresses a much wider part of the spectrum. Uh, new um, numeration technologies or the ability to, to address uh, spectrum um, separation uh, and therefore be able to modulate exactly how you abstract and allocate spectrum across different competing users and flows, etc. So based on performance that you want to deliver, the radio now, the new radio, allows us to, to really use smart techniques, software-driven techniques, to deliver the performance, the reliability that we expect. Other many circumstances, there are companies that use really far forward-looking technologies like Doppler delay uh, to, uh, to address um, interference and deliver essentially double the spectrum efficiency. Then we have um, software technologies that really transform the network itself. So if we look at the evolution of the RAN, we have, you know, in up until 3G essentially, um, everything was packed together on the microcell, the baseband unit, the uh, remote radio unit, and they all connected back to the evolved packet core or the, the GPRS uh, core, et cetera. Uh, the next evolution of that was to really separate the BBU from the remote radio unit and therefore support multiple remote radios, multiple antennas with one BBU, uh, typically built as an ATCA, um, uh, in the ATCA form, sitting you know, in the vicinity of many microcells. That led to the next significant um, evolution step, which was the, soft the softwareization of going away from ATCA platforms, proprietary platforms, to software based BBU. The baseband unit runs on, you know, typically again, not quite COTS hardware, but it's all software. And the great uh, advancement going from virtualized BBUs to disaggregated, disaggregating the BBU to the, you know, lo-fi and, um, and the uh, MAC layer with uh, the distributed unit being closer to the radio head and the control, the central unit, being further up uh, the stack, right? So that was the beginning of rethinking the network architecture from more of a centralized, and again, when we talk about a global uh, network operator, it's very hard to to really call it centralized because we're talking about, you know, national data centers that counted in the, you know, tens and, you know, sometimes hundreds. But still, the packet core was centralized in, a, in major regions, right? That gave us the stepping stone from where we start rethinking the network architecture to a far more distributed architecture that starts looking very much like what's happening on the hyperscaler world edge computing, et cetera. We'll come back to that. And finally, the most, in my view, in my humble opinion, the most important evolution was what Oran brought to the table. Uh, the Open Oran Alliance essentially refactored again the layers of uh, the BBU and they introduced the notion of a controller, the radio intelligent controller. What I keep calling the operating system of the new radio. Think about the radio being 
um, essentially rigid without the ability to, to use you know, all of the, of the new technologies versus a radio that really reacts to the real-time needs of the devices, of the users, of the location, right? So all of that is controlled by applications. And when you have applications, you have to have a platform to run those applications. Well, that platform is the radio intelligent controller. It's all software. It sees all the use, has visibility of what's happening in real time, and allows us to build applications. And that's where the innovation comes in 5G and beyond, right? To build applications that address um, energy efficiency, um, throughput, latency, and get us far beyond what 3GPP mandates as the three main pillars of uh, 3GPP, which is the uh, uh, massive machine-to-machine -machine communications, the low latency URLLC, as well as uh, uh, the enhanced broadband, right? But we have a lot of other variations in between, which we need to support for different types of use cases, different segments of the industry. So that represents the evolution. Um, and this is the agenda I'm going to uh, follow today. I'll talk about, and I don't know, yeah. I'll talk about um, network sli slicing, which is near and dear to my heart, in addition to the, to the RIC, and I'll try to put them together. Why the RIC and what does the RIC have to do with network slicing? Um, what is network slicing? We all know, right? Um, we have networks that look monolithic, rigid, to all devices, all use cases, uh, and network slicing. Advancing is not going very well. Yeah, that's what I mean. Up until 4G, that's where we were, right? One size fits all when it comes to the network. Now, 5G will customize the performance, the signal strength, uh, the latency, the reliability, the security, if you wish, to different devices based on what its device type, its use case requires. And we'll do that dynamically or it does that dynamically already. To be able to deliver network slicing, a key requirement is end-to-end. -end. And if we look at the literature, and if we look at what's happening actually in industry, the state of the art, we tend to forget the end-to-end, -end, right? It was the same <laughs> um, challenge that we had with TCP many years ago when we never realize that as soon as you have channel asymmetry in, in TCP, TCP breaks down because it looks at every packet loss as uh, error loss or uh, congestion loss, I'm sorry, right? Which is not the case. So if we forget the end-to-end -end requirement in network slicing and the ability to really offer a strong SLA, the service level agreement or the um, final objective, um, in, a, in an infrastructure that is immense, it covers not just an area, a local you know, uh, city or, or a state, but potentially an entire uh, country, right? The whole of the United States. How do you deliver? So we have two devices, or so we have one device talking to a server that happens to be in the East Coast. You need to deliver the end-to-end -end, uh, notion to be able to, to really address um, the requirements of 5G. So, Speaking of distributed infrastructure, networks start looking like this. We have um, no centralized data centers. We have um, what you can call a data center very close to the, to the radio where you, know, you typically, typically deploy in an ORAN architecture the distributed unit. You have a regional data center, uh, which we can call the edge which typically hosts the central unit, CU, as well as a number of applications, maybe breakout capability. So that's where you would put the UPF. Uh, and uh, then you have regional, you have national data centers that keep, that's where the operator typically would keep subscriber databases um, and would run the control plane function 
um, as long as latency is not an issue, right? Otherwise, we also distribute all the functions of the control plane and we anchor them from the edge, you know, to the local, to the regional, to the central, depending um, on, on what the end goal is. In addition to that, now you can say, okay, well, we're talking about literally, if you look at Verizon, they have 25,000 microcells. And if we look at 5G and densification in major metropolitan areas, uh, where you will need hundreds of small cells, right? Because as you know, 5G and high frequencies, uh, attenuation is a problem, uh, penetration of the signal is a problem, so you need to really address it by densification. So the net of it is that we're talking about tens of thousands of um, edge clouds and hadrons of regional and central clouds, etc. In addition to that, um, you have to decide where you're going to put your main data path components, data plan components, right? UPF is not and you know, it's not a centralized notion anymore. You don't have a single, like in previous generations, we had, we had the SGSN and the GGSN, and these were serving a huge geographical area, centralized nodes, um, and you had one of them. UPF now gets distributed, right? And it's, you can have a UPF, which is, think of it as a glorified router, that does a lot more than just packet forwarding. Um, you may have a UPF very close to where the, the radio is for breakout, local breakout. You may have another, you know, version of the UPF um, in the local or in the regional data center. And the traffic crosses both UPFs, one for selective breakout, the other for um, Kalia type of, uh, you know, law enforcement um, functionality the next one for policy enforcement and so on. So you, you can have multiple of these UPFs in general. The other thing that this kind of architecture requires is dynamic placement of the UPF. And we'll talk about that because if you want to support your LLC and EMBB, EMBB and, um, and, and the other use cases in between, you need to be able to dynamically orchestrate uh, all of these, both data plane as well as control plane functions. So that's how a typical 5G network would look or looks like. Um, most of the large tier one operators are looking at distributing, as we said, the functionality to several data centers. In addition to that, they're trying to figure ways, to figure out ways of uh, leveraging um, the presence of hyperscalers, right, like Azure, AWS and Google, et cetera, and local cloud providers so that they, they can quickly can address the, the, uh, the challenge of both cost as well as time to market and uh, market coverage. If we have presence of you know, cloud providers, why not host your edge compute, your edge uh, functions in an area where you don't have an operation? So, we have really the confluence of many disrupting trends that promise to put the power in the hands of the operators for the first time, I would say, uh, so that they can really open up the opportunity for new revenue streams, new applications, disruptive applications, as a matter of fact, and, um, and um, uh, propel them to what we can call the 21st century, right? To, to new technology so that they can move as fast as the rest of our community moves, as the, you know, the likes of, you know, the ones I mentioned. So let's go back and uh, look at network slicing. As I promised, this is really the focus of the presentation, network slicing. And we all sometimes make the mistake to think, oh, network slicing, yeah, it's, it's a VPN. No, 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 it's not a VPN. Um, Network slicing is, uh, you know, the ability to support your LLC, enhance, uh, you know, broadband, uh, and, um, uh, and the machine-to-machine, -machine, IoT, and that's it. That's not it. Network slicing is much more than that. 
And the example I use to uh, underscore uh, what we view at Juniper and Network Slice, which is a more encompassing um, you know, use case, is the MVNO, the Mobile Virtual Network Operator. Think of an MVNO that is not local, which is typically the case, is not nationwide, uh, but it's planet scale, right? And the question is, can we onboard, assuming that MVNO has, um, has spectrum you know, um, agreements with local tier one operators, we would like to be able to create this MVNO in the form of a slice in not in 10 years, but in, in an hour or two hours, right? And it sounds like a crazy idea. Now, let's take that idea and scale it down. Can we onboard an enterprise? Can we create, you know, companies start every day? And they all, you know, want to deploy applications, set up their um, operating, you know, uh, HR systems and accounting systems and uh, development systems, etc. And they're scratching their head. Am I going to go to Azure? Am I going to go to, go to Google? Am I going to go to um, uh, AWS? Am I going to build my own data center, right? We want to take that friction out of the equation and just provide the tools, and that's where network slicing comes into the picture, to really onboard an enterprise and any use case in general in a matter of a couple of, a few hours, right? And that involves applications, the services, the networking, as well as the devices that need to be connected, right? So that's really what 5G has the potential of delivering. And to do so, we need three key ingredients to cook up what we call network slicing. The declarative, the ability to do extreme orchestration, declarative way of defining a use case, a very complex use case. Uh, intuitive way of designing this use case and provisioning resources as well as the, as well as the workloads to be able to bring it to reality. To do so, you need to address the end-to-end -end SLA, right? To be able to guarantee performance, uh, no matter what the use case is, to guarantee latency, and to potentially tailor the application uh, posture and solution that you deliver to that use case. And to be able to do the SLA, you need the end-to-end. -end. And that's where wireless communications come into the picture. That's where the, the radio intelligent controller becomes an essential part. Because, you know, if I'm stuck with what LTE gives me, I can only deliver one type of SLA. But if I promise, you know, the three, what we call the three pillars of 5G, and everything in between, then I better be able to modulate exactly how I manage spectrum, right? And I cannot quite do that because that's happening in the DU, in the MAC layer scheduler, and the lo-fi, but, but if they expose an interface to me, to the operating system, the radio intelligent controller, and I can decide, I have the ability to monitor uh, the SLA on a per flow and on a per slice basis, then I can tell the radio how to dynamically allocate uh, spectrum, PRBs, right, the abstraction of spectrum, and I can say, give more PRBs here for this duration of time, take away PR PRBs from there, etc. But the sky is the limit as to what you can do with the rig. So let me um, jump quickly here on, and give you a flavor of what we're doing at Juniper and why I believe that the need for, uh, uh, you know, uh, extreme automation is fundamental in 5G uh, to be able to deliver the promise of 5G. So, again, slicing, um, the idea is simple. We have an orchestrator, we have radio, we have core, we have transport, right? And we create a slice, and the orchestrator provisions resources and, and uh, deploys workloads. And if we can repeat that, uh, we have slices, you know, as many slices as the infrastructure can, can tolerate. Now, the challenge here is that 
we don't want to keep building physical infrastructure, right? We want to have all of that sharing one physical infrastructure, and that's where the complexity comes. Um, and some of these problems are not new problems, they are very old problems, right? You remember, well, you don't remember, uh, I don't even remember, uh, but the, the, the good old days when, you know, compute was, was not, you know, it was not possible to share the, you know, the mainframe, then Multics came and then, you know, time sharing, the concept of time sharing. And uh, we took it to the extreme and now we can do scheduling at the microsecond, at the, you know, down to, you know, um, to the level of granularity that allows us to decide how to share the processor based on the needs of the application, right? And it's fully dynamic. Well, it's the same concept, except now that you have to apply this in an extremely complex um, infrastructure. So, automation, declarative way of defining the use cases and, and building the lower layers that allows us to automatically um, uh, bring up the infrastructure in a fully virtualized environment is what my focus is at Juniper, one of my two, you know, focus terms. And that makes it interesting. It makes it actually very exciting. I remember the old days of, uh, you know, being in academia, uh, coming up with a research problem, you know, ambitious research problem, and then giving, giving, it, giving it all to try to solve it, right? Except now I don't have to write uh, proposals. Uh, I do miss working with graduate students, but we have several interns. Um, so, what is this SMO, the Service Management Orchestration? It is, it has several components. Uh, many of them are uh, defined by the three GPP architecture and ORAN, and the APIs are very well documented, very well defined by, you know, in release 17, you have pretty much all the details, but 3GPP defines the concept, the abstractions, right? How to build such a system is the big challenge. So what we do at Juniper is we create the notion of um, an, a, an Uber slice that we call a tenant. A, and a tenant has the ability, is a totally, you know, virtual entity, right, that can span the entire country or it can be very local. It can be an enterprise tenant. It can be an MVNO that operates across the country. And we want to be able to give the tenant the ability to operate their own virtual network, if you wish, as if they own the infrastructure. That's the other major goal, right? So up there, the, uh, without getting into 3GPP uh, nomenclature, um, there is something called the communication service um, layer and the network you know, slice management layer, um, both of them are tenant specific, right? So a tenant, you can see the green tenant and the blue tenant. The blue tenant now wants to onboard a new slice, a new use case. That's a requirement in, in this network slice management orchestration that um, uh, we've built at, um, at Juniper. And the whole community actually moves in that direction but imagine what we can do if we are able to really bring the level of automation um, at that scale, right? And, and really deliver the promise of declarative um, orchestration, resource provisioning orchestration, if we do so in any hybrid environment. In other words, we don't put any constraints and cloud native now, cloud native technologies give us that ability. We don't need to say, you know, access and edge are going to be our own data center. And um, a regional data center, DC is going to be, you know, again, our own data center. We say, you know, revamp and redefine your architecture based on what your resources and your financial constraints are and leverage the cloud providers. So you can have a region of your network that rides on VPC, another region that rides on Azure. Uh, and we will give you the, uh, the uh, level of automation that you need to manage all of this as you own the infrastructure. That's the end goal. So this 5G 
uh, network slice management orchestration architecture has three semantic uh, domains, the radio, the transport, and the core. The radio is the most complex, and many of you here are in wireless communications and signal processing. Um, and that's not the way, I mean, that's not the, the place where we really operate through the SMO. I'll come to that. It's really the rig that becomes the abstraction between the, the you know, physical run, the virtualized run, and the rest of the network. Transport is not an island. Transport happens in many parts of the network. Even in a connection, you cross, you know, front hall, that may be Ethernet or CIPRI, uh, mid hall, back hall, you name it, right? Multiple islands of back hall. So I said these are semantic domains, but they, are, they have multiple incarnations. And then you have the separation of data plane and control plane. That's a very strong separation in the 3GPP architecture that really allows us now to have the ability to dynamically decide where all these functions, which are all virtualized or containerized, which data center they're going to be anchored to, and therefore define the exact functionality of each data center. Transport is extremely important and one of the complex uh, parts of the end-to-end -end solution. So this is again one incarna incarnation of the transport, right? Connecting two data centers. Think about two applications running on two servers, right? Or, you know, uh, a data path and a, an application server. I mean, a UPF and an application server. Running in two data centers that are, you know, remote, right? And you want to enforce between those two part of the slice that defines that they are part of, right? So, and part of the slice may have latency and bandwidth requirements and security. So I have to figure out a way to take that, you know, for example, one of the uh, orange circles that represent, let's say, the UPF and connect it to a green circle on the other data center and de deliver the end-to-end -end SLA, which means that I have to set up VPNs in my data center uh, through the fabric, make sure that um, I, I set up the right um, um, SLA profiles on the PEs that connect the data centers and enforce the policy in real time. So it's not, it's not a simple problem, um, but that's one of the problems we have solved at Juniper and, and others. Let me know, we don't have time to go through this, but let me go to the next one, which is um, um, the other critical component in delivering the end-to-end, -end, which is the radio intelligent controller. But I have uh, some slides here that show what I mean by declarative way of designing use cases and building these complex um, uh, networks, right? Uh, so it's, this is the visual aspect, not necessarily the declarative aspect, but um, these are snapshots of, um, of a real orchestrator. But so we, we pick, you know, the functional components, we define the subnets, and we hook them there, right? And magic happens. Then we can monitor them. We can, we can have visual view of the network that allows us to click on a node and get um, performance data do reconfiguration or, um, you know, initiate, you know, uh, uh, configuration parameters um, and um, reconnect the network. You know, I can take a link from one of the light blue edge data centers and connect it to um, a public cloud. And all the magic happens automatically below that, right? So let me skip this. Uh, and come back to the, since we don't have a whole lot of time, visibility, observability uh, is key and uh, it's driven by AI and machine learning automation. And the last part is really the radio intelligent controller, the other favorite part of mine, the operating system of the new radio, right? So 
the red boxes here are the pa parts of the distributed um, ORAN run, right? Disaggregated run. And we have the 5G core. And uh, the radio intelligent controller has two components. It's a platform that has the near real time, which tends to manage a limited number of DUs, a limited number of macro cells or small cells, and the centralized brains of the radio, which is the non real time rig. Think of it uh, again as, um, you know, in the, in the network architecture, as the, the rig being regional, driving dozens of macro cells, the near real time, and the, near, uh, the non real time rig being in, in the you know, national data center, having visibility. There are nuances that have to do with delays and you know, the, the requirement for delays, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the concept, right? Now, if that platform has visibility into what's happening in the controller, in the scheduler, in DU, and has the ability to reconfigure um, how the radio, the BVU, the distributed DU now, manages the radio, the spectrum, uh, we can do all sorts of things. I have visibility about devices, about users, uh, traffic, everything, right? So we can do all sorts of cool and interesting things by deploying applications that leverage that knowledge and create opportunities for energy efficiency, admission control, security policies, and on and on and on. And the space here is really a playground of innovation that I would love to see more activity in universities because the sky is the limit as to what you can do. And I'll give you just a sneak preview of some of these capabilities. Um, applications that we have built or other you know, companies have built and they range from um, tenant slice, uh, tenant aware admission control. So think of, um, you know, uh, let's take Portland. There are a lot of people around here during the day, but at night, I'm not sure if that's the case, if it's a residential downtown or not, but at night, um, you know, people scatter back to the residential areas, right? So during the day, you have the likes of Uber um, swarming the downtown. Uh, but at night, you know, Uber is in the, you know, residential areas. Who knows? I mean, that may not be the ideal example. But now, if Uber wants to have a deal with um, a carrier, take your favorite carrier, and say, you know, I need guaranteed, I need this SLA on my cars, I need this, you know, this level of, um, you know, performance up to a thousand cars, right? Now, but in the Portland major metropolitan area, they may have, you know, 5,000 cars. Well, today, they will have to pay for 5,000 cars. If I can support 1,000 cars and I allow the radio resources to follow where the cars are, the Uber cars are, right, during the day, the macro cells serving the downtown are going to be serving, putting more resources for Uber cars, right, and they can admit up to 1,000. But the macro cells, you know, in the, you know, outside Portland, may not provide the level of connectivity to Uber cars, right? And then in the evening, you shift the radio resources from the downtown to where it's needed. So that's, that's the concept of slice aware admission control. And we have other capabilities like, um, um, th this, is, this paints a, 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 uh, an emerging situation where you have specific number of PR, PR, uh, PDUs allocated to a school and to a nearby hospital. And on an emergency case, you have now the ability to take away the, you know, the PDUs from the allocated to the school and, and allocate them to the hospital, right? These are real needs that 5G and network slicing can support. And they are disruptive in that respect because we can put so many more uh, services on a 5G network. Um, slice assurance use case, where you can, um, uh, this works through the actual protocol, you know, how the non-real-time rig through the A1 interface talks to the near-real-time rig and through the O1, the configuration essentially interface and 
P the performance configuration and fault management um, APIs, we can manage what's happening at the radio. Uh, so not very important to look at the, you know, the, at the steps, but the bottom line here basically is that uh, the next slide shows better that I can modulate the resources that I can give to a use case, to a connection, to a slice, a, you know, a user, a user within a slice based on the dynamic real-time needs of that slice and what SLA for that slice is, um, is assigned. So again, something that is not possible in 4G networks today. Um, there are many more cases and some of them are on the slides that you can follow uh, with beam forming and um, energy efficiency applications that we can use. You know, you take basically um, during the day in, a, in an office um, neighborhood, you have macro cells, you have booster cells, um, and you have neighboring cells, right? At night, you may want to turn off some of those cells and boost the power of the booster cell to cover a bigger area or vice versa. Um, you can do all sorts of things to conserve power without affecting the user experience uh, and um, save money, save energy. Uh, operators spend almost 70% of the annual OPEX, the, the, the annual you know, OPEX on the radio uh, to power bills. It's incredible. And it's not only that, it's bad for the environment, right? So energy efficiency is very high. Uh, and this is all delivered through the radio intelligent controller. There are the classical self-organizing network and the distributed and the centralized SON type of applications that are migrating these days on the RIC, on the radio intelligent controller, bringing new levels of efficiency. Uh, massive MIMO and beam forming uh, brings us new opportunities to deliver uh, new levels of energy efficiency. For example, uh, if we look at, you know, typical, this is what, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, 64 by 64 uh, massive MIMO antenna, where you can use also beam forming to service an office building, but, you know, after five or after six, depending on who you work for, um, you turn off, you know, those... Um, transmitters and you save power, you know. Simple optimizations to complex optimizations that become possible again through or thanks to the ORAN architecture, the softwareization of the radio. Why is it important? Because it, it was the last bastion in our ability to deliver end-to-end. -end. We can deliver end-to-end -end throughout the network now, right? But that radio that, you know, 4G up until 4G was, you know, the area that was uh, dominated by only three, four vendors, uh, closed, proprietary, and we were unable to, to, to really crack it open and, and stretch the notion of SLA across, you know, uh, to the device, over the air to the device. Finally, um, when it comes to private 5G, everybody expects that to be a huge booming market, right, in the, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in the next five to seven years. And nobody knows how it's gonna happen. Is it going to be standalone? Here in the US, we have CBRS spectrum. Yeah, you know, that's a way to do it without the involvement of the operator, but that's only US based. If you look at the rest of the world, there is no free, I mean, there is a lot of talk about, you know, a band that can be for public use but, you know, don't take it to the bank. So operators are going to play one way or another a pretty significant role. But still, even if the operator um, is involved and allows you to use the spectrum, uh, the big question is, is the operator going to, the operators, are they going to deliver really the, you know, private 5G? Or is it going to be a model that will be realized through other means? And we believe that we're going to have both um, through operator uh, realizations of private 5G, and by private we mean um, 
a 5G network or a 6G network that essentially works alongside your Wi-Fi, except it delivers um, strong SLA. Again, if you are a factory floor automation you know, uh, entity, uh, you cannot rely on Wi-Fi to plug your robots. If you have an assembly, a delicate assembly line, Wi-Fi is not reliable, right? And it does not deliver the latency that you need to, to have a reliable assembly line. Uh, so, um, smart warehousing. You cannot put Wi-Fi uh, on machines that do mission critical tasks, okay? So, Wi-Fi and 5G, private 5G, are probably going to work side by side. There are several people who believe that eventually 5G is going to replace, you know, Wi-Fi. But, you know, nobody takes that again seriously, not for the next several years. So, if you see to the left, we see enterprise vendor managed uh, private mobile networks. And to the right, you see the service provider managed private mobile networks. And the only difference is where the RIC st uh, stays and, and most, most importantly, where the UPF, you know, the, the, the data plane function that decides where packets flow, okay? So with that, um, I will come to the conclusion here about network slicing, and I'll make a prediction that network slicing, prediction, I hate to make predictions. I, 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 I'll tell you what I believe. Um, network slicing is going to be a transformational uh, technology that will impact every aspect of networking, wireless, wireline, uh, as well as um, um, uh, cloud computing, the way we use cloud computing today, okay. because the concept of being able to stand up a very complex use case by sitting in front of a, you know, single pane of glass and address security, performance, application, um, you know, uh, onboarding, etc., cetera, in a, in a very simple, visual, and declarative way, the notion of that, I think, is very powerful. And, and 5G gives us the ability to start, you know, to make the leap because network slicing is one of those use cases in telco. But network slicing is not gonna live only within telco. It's gonna be a ubiquitous technology, I think, in the coming years. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs>